I'm Dr. Lawrence Newman, Director of the Division of Headache at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York, speaking for Medscape. Today I'll be talking about disabling migraine through facts, figures, and faces. Here's what we know about migraine. It's an enormous problem. In fact, migraine affects more than 1 billion people worldwide and more than 40 million Americans. Migraine affects about 13% of adults and about 8% of children and adolescents. The lifetime prevalence of migraine is about 20%, and in fact, about 3% of the population of this country has the chronic form of migraine, in which they suffer from attacks about 15 days or more per month. We also know that migraine affects people young, usually starting before age 35, and affecting people predominantly in what we call their peak productive years, between the ages of 25 and 55, when they're out and about in the workplace, taking care of themselves, their families, or in school. According to the World Health Organization, migraine is the third most common disease in the world and the sixth most disabling. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, a day lived with migraine is as disabling as a day lived with dementia, quadriplegia, or acute psychosis. And in fact, migraine has found to be more disabling than blindness, angina, or paraplegia. But really, those are just words on a page, and they don't express the true impact on what migraine does to the family or the sufferer. In fact, Rob, one of my patients, puts it better and into a better perspective when he tells us that imagine all of the people, possessions, and activities you love the most in life being right in front of you, but being in so much pain that you can't reach out to grab them. That's how my migraines have made me feel every single day for the better part of the last decade. I've missed so many crucial days at school, so many paying hours at work, and so much leisure time with my friends and family, all because I have this disease, and it controls me like I'm a puppet. Now that speaks much more dramatically than just words on a slide or words in a, in a neurologic paper. So who is burdened by migraine? Well, clearly the patient, but also their family, their employer, assuming they can maintain employment, and our entire healthcare system. We see that migraine from, from recent studies actually tears at the very fabric of the family. It has problems in patients dealing with their spouses, their children, and on the affected individual as well. From the CAMEO study, we see that migraine causes stress in the lives of patients with migraine, even when they're not actually suffering from an attack. In fact, a third of spouses of those people with episodic migraine and half of spouses of those with the chronic form of the disease report that they avoid the person with migraine because of their headache. We see that migraine has an effect on the child, so that people with migraine and their spouses reported that the spouse was more demanding on children because of the migrainous headache. And we see that the effect on the individual is enormous. The migraine sufferer themselves tell us that they would believe they would be better parents, in fact, if they did not have this disease. Abby tells us in even more poignant terms. She tells us that daily migraines for the past eight years made me quit my career. Now, as the mother of two young children, the severe pain greatly impacts my ability to care for them. My family gets a much lesser version of the person I used to be. I have less patience, I am more irritable, and constantly stressed by the chronic pain. I spend a lot of time resting instead of being with my kids. I have been on a seemingly endless search for relief, and I have not yet found effective treatment, and often think I never will. Quite, quite dramatic, and in fact, a story we hear all too often. Migraine also affects the employer. Migraine cost American employees about $20 billion each year, both from direct and indirect costs. And not surprisingly, the chronic form of migraine has more burden than the episodic form. The indirect costs, translated as lost productivity, translates to about $1,700 for the episodic form and $3,300 per year for the chronic form. Cost and predictors of lost productivity time has shown us that men with chronic migraine cost employees about $200 more per week than those with episodic migraine, and the difference for women was slightly less at about $90 per week. There's also lower employment status in patients who suffer from chronic than episodic migraine. And here from this slide, we see that about 10% of those patients with episodic migraine are occupationally disabled, Nearly twice as many, 20%, are occupationally disabled with chronic migraine. 
Steve puts it even more succinctly. Steve tells us, I've experienced my first migraine at age 12. Over the next 12 years, my migraines increased in severity and frequency. I am now 24 years old and should be able to have a full-time job. Because of my chronic migraines, I am unable to work or participate in daily activities, and I have been left stuck in a dark room. I no longer feel like I have specific attacks. I would say at this point that I have a migraine for two years that just fluctuates in severity. Patients with chronic migraines also utilize the healthcare system more often than those with episodic migraine. And we see from this slide, it involves not only outpatient, but inpatient and emergency department visits as well. There are quite a few therapeutic shortfalls, unfortunately, that we still have to deal with when treating patients who suffer from migraine. In fact, we only have a small group of agents that are available to us in our armamentarium. The newest agents for acute treatments, the triptans, are nearly three decades old. They were first marketed in the 1990s, and they're not a panacea. They don't work for everybody. And in fact, many of our patients who used to be good candidates for these drugs, now as they've gotten older, no longer can take the medications. Unfortunately, there are no breakthrough classes yet, but hopefully in the future, we're gonna have several. Also, there have been no new preventive agents specifically for migraine that have been developed in more than half a century. Hopefully that will change in the next several months as well. Why is that? Well, there are several reasons. One of the biggest problems is stigma that patients with migraine experience. And in fact, when compared with other similar disorders, and by that I mean chronic disorders that have an episodic occurrence, migraine stigma is significantly greater than it is for asthma. The stigma for migraine is equal to that of epilepsy and panic disorder. Not surprisingly, those people with the chronic form of migraine are more stigmatized than those with the episodic form. And we also see that stigma is correlated most strongly with their inability to work and with absenteeism if they do have a job. So why is it that people with migraine are stigmatized? Well, there are many reasons. One is that migraine is not considered a real medical illness. Patients appear normal between attacks, so coworkers, family members, friends don't understand how they could have actually suffered so severely up until that point. We don't yet have any specific biomarkers, so there's no blood test. There's no scan features that will tell us if somebody has migraine or not. And migraine tends to be comorbid with other psychiatric and psychological disorders. And more often than not, many people with migraine report that their attacks are triggered by stress. So migraine often gets categorized as a psychological condition when in fact it's not. And importantly, although migraine is not a life-threatening condition or viewed as not a life-threatening condition, it really is. In fact, migraine is a leading cause of suicidal ideation and attempts in both the civilian and military population. Rob puts it in better terms. Rob tells us, it is surrendering to the fact that life will never be the same and that it will always include varying degrees of pain, both mental and physical. It is dealing with the losses that are inherent with this condition. It is putting on a happy face, pretending things are okay on the outside when on the inside they are anything but. It is knowing that people without chronic pain do not understand chronic pain. It is not knowing what tomorrow will bring. It is all easier said than done. It is no way to live, yet life goes on. So how do we disable migraine? Well, we do it in a number of ways. We do it first and foremost by changing misconceptions. We need to teach people, physicians, patients, family members, and employers, that migraine is a disease of the brain. And we do this by building on what we already know, both neurobiological, imaging, epigenetic, and genetic insights that we have. But it's not both, because there's more than two. Building on what we already know, neurobiological, imaging, genetic and epigenetic insights that we've discovered, and by educating the public and the healthcare community. The good news is that things may change relatively soon. Several new agents have been submitted to the FDA as prevention, the first new class of medication in nearly half a century specifically for the prevention of migraine. Thank you for your attention. I'm Dr. Lawrence Newman.